Sometimes the best way to measure where you are at in life and where you're, you know, what's going on in your life is to listen to what comes out of your mouth. Because it says in the Bible that out of the overflow of your heart, your mouth speaks. And have you ever heard yourself say something you thought, oh, didn't know I was thinking that, didn't know that was where I was at. Sometimes the person to pay the most attention to is yourself to work out where you're at and what's going on. And I heard myself say something during a conversation, oh, two, three weeks ago now. I listened to what I said, and I thought, whoa, what I just said is so far removed from what I would have said 10 years ago that I thought, I've either found some great truth or I've abandoned something I never should have left behind. So I've been sort of mulling over it, thinking, well, which... Which is it? Because if I've abandoned something, I better go back. And if I've come to a great truth, I better, yay, be really happy and, you know, move on from there and and share that. Um, The debate was around a specific thing that isn't, you know, isn't my story to share. But the essence was the extent to which we could believe God to provide things that we desired and that we wanted. And, you know, it raised the question, what will he provide me with and what won't he? If you can say that God won't do something. What, what can I believe for? Can I believe for the things I need? Can I believe for the things I want? Things that, can I believe for ways out of things? And can I believe that he's going to help me find ways into things? And to what extent is that provision based on anything I do or do not do? Now, I want to show you this quick clip from um, Bruce Almighty that I remembered last night. And uh, if you've not seen Bruce Almighty, it's a cracking film because uh, there's this guy and he's sort of going about his business and then he, he, he sort of challenge, almost sets the challenge one day, you know, to himself. Of if he was God, he could do a better job. So God, in the form of Morgan Freeman, who's a very cool God, rocks up and says, all right then, you can do a better job. I make you God for a while. So of course, I mean, it's an incredible film. You've got to see the whole thing. But we're at the point where he started hearing voices in his head. And so he's trying to sort of use his new powers he's he's got. And all he can hear is these voices. And God meets him on top of the mountain and basically says, they're people's prayers. And I just want to show you this two-minute clip because it's funny and it also makes a great point. Okay. Well, you took the job, Bruce, so I suggest you get to it. Prayers, prayers, okay, prayers. Uh... This creepy whisper thing has to end. Organization and management. That's what I need. I need a system, something concrete. Concentrate. Files. Let all prayers be organized into files. Well, that takes care of the voices. Not exactly a space saver, though. Grace might notice. I know. Prayer post its! Something with a lock. Security. Combination. A password. A password. Yo! You've got prayers. Welcome to the Revelation Superhighway. We bless. No mess. Downloading now. (laughs) It's good. It's good. This is gonna take a while. One million five hundred twenty-seven thousand five hundred and three prayer requests. I better manifest some coffee. Hola, Juan Valdez. Buenos días. Buenos días. Disfruto un buen café. Gracias, señor. Adiós. Adiós. Now that's fresh mountain-grown coffee from the hills of Colombia. Oh, come on! Oh. What a bunch of 
one-liners. This is gonna suck my whole life. Yes, to all. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Now everybody's happy. Okay, now it makes you think, doesn't it, how it's quite a tough being God, really. And I'm glad that he doesn't just click a button, yes to all, whilst sort of being removed from our lives, because he is a lot more involved than that, isn't he? But I have found that Increasingly, I find it quite hard to pray to God for specific outcomes, more so than I ever have. I think when I was sort of much younger, I would sort of sit and ask for very specific things, whereas now I tend to find that quite hard. And I think it's because then you sort of almost had quite a lot of wishful thinking, didn't you? You had your idea in your head of what you wanted. But now I find myself questioning, am I asking God to do something that he's not able to do? Am I asking him to do something out of my agenda? Am I asking him to do something that will actually override a critical process in me or someone else? And I don't quite know now how it works the same way I used to think I had the handle on it. Um, But that's all right, isn't it? Because if God's a God of mystery, if I could understand it all, that would make him very limited, So some of that mystery leaves us with questions, doesn't it? Now, I want to believe that God is kind of Father Christmas-like, with me on his nice list, receiving goodies because I've been good. But you know what? I don't believe that. And perhaps at one point, I did believe a version of that because I could tell that by what I would say. Um, And I've wrestled to some extent with letting go of the idea that if my life has God in it, then it should look a certain way, I should be a certain way, I should have certain things, I should not suffer certain things because I'm on God's list somehow. Has anybody else ever struggled with that sort of thing? Now, I know where this comes from. You know, I've been in church my whole life, and we hear things that are wonderful truths, but they pass through our filters and become a little bit wonky from their original. So when we hear things like, all things work together for the good of those who love him, a credible truth, but this can become, if I get it right, everything's going to be good in my life, yes? When we hear things like, don't worry, seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things are going to be added unto you, we can hear, oh, if I put God first, I'm not going to have any worries, because everything's just going to be coming my way. If you, it says as well, Jesus says, if you with all your shortcomings know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will God do the same? I know what I would give to my boy. I know it. It's instinctive, isn't it, as a parent? So when then we don't get what we feel we want or need, it's a little bit like, hang on a minute, you're Father God. And I thought that you would just give to me. Um, Last one, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, ask and it will be done. So if I can believe enough, I could guarantee my outcome then, can't I? Now, can you hear how these great truths all have a context and incredible application and power, but if they pass through our filters, if you're not careful, they become something else, and they become somehow a standard we have to meet or a standard that God has to meet, and then we end up like, ah, what's going on? Now, when things do not work out for us, We look for answers, don't we? We like to think, well, hang on a minute, God, I believed you for that and it didn't happen. So we then try and look for why not. So there was the man born blind and Jesus tells a story of this man born blind and the people around him at the time said, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And I mean, Jesus says something incredible. He says, do you know what? Wrong question. This happened so my glory is revealed. But I thought it was interesting that, that we go there, don't we? Whose fault is it? Is it my fault? Is it their fault? Is it God's fault? Is God somehow withholding? Is God mad with me? Has he left me? If he's left me, can I make him come back? Or if I've left him, can I find a way back? And we end up with all these questions. So when we don't get our outcome, I've listed here three things that might happen. Number one, We might make ourselves our own God in that situation. Adam and Eve, when they perceived that God was somehow withholding something that they believed they needed, they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in doing that, they became self-sufficient. They said, I'll do it my way. Yes? So if we're in a situation in life where we're not getting the outcome we want, we have to be very careful that we don't do a takeover. We're like, hang on a minute, God. You're not going to sort this out. I'll sort this out instead then. My way. Second thing is, links to it, 
very much direct, not making sense, links to that. We find another way to make that happen, like Abraham with Ishmael. Yeah, those of you who've been here on a Wednesday night, Abraham was believing God for a child, for, for a generation to be birthed out of him. His wife was barren. Sarah could not have children. She was very, very, very old. So they believe for a while, and then they get tired because you're like, God, nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. So then what he ended up doing was finding another way of having a child with his slave servant lady. And so instead of actually hanging on in there and believing for the child of promise, he ends up birthing another child, and that child represented slavery. And when we find those other ways in our life, we end up enslaving ourselves to something that we should not actually have ever had in our lives and that creates such conflict you can hear more on that if you listen to the tapes from Wednesday third thing we might do linked to Joel's preach the other week is we distance ourselves. when Peter saw looked at this savior and thought you went no this isn't the outcome I want for you savior what did he do he distanced himself found himself at the wrong place at the wrong time disowning and denying so if you are not getting an outcome in your life You need to be very careful that you think through how you're going to process it. Not by thinking, right, then I'm going to look at the rights and wrongs of this, work out what's going on, look at that standard. You're not going to go and try and make your own solution, and you're also not going to distance yourself. Very difficult to do. Now, let me show you this story that I've called The Boys in the Fire. Who's ever heard of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? When I was telling Daniel this the other day, because he was helping me prepare this preach the other day, I was saying, what do you think about this? He's really good. What do you think about this? And I said, he thought that Ben, Ben, Graham, I'm sorry to embarrass you, but he has a teddy bear that he had when he was a kid called Abed-me-go. It's like a monkey thing. So he's like, (laughs) he thought he was talking about, it's cute, isn't it? He thought he was talking about Abed-me-go, the the teddy bear. But anyway, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abed, I want to say Abed-me-go, what is it? abed I don't even know the actual name for this one. Abed- Abednego. I can't even say it now. Um, these boys lived at a time when there was a king. And, oh, it's a great story. Read it. It's in the book of Daniel. There was a king, and the king says, Never mind any other god, bow to me. I am the only one that gets to be bowed to, and if you're caught bowing to any other god other than me, I'm going to burn you alive. Yay! Aren't you glad the queen's not like that? Now, we're going to read this little extract from Daniel 3, 13 to 25. Do read the rest at home, but I'm conscious of time. So, oh, look, I could read it from here. From here. Is that it? Right. Furious, King Nebuchadnezzar ordered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be brought in. When the man were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar asked, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you don't respect my gods and refuse to worship the gold statue that I have set up? I'm giving you a second chance, but from now on, when the big hand strikes up, you must go to your knees and worship the statues I have made. If you don't worship it, you will be pitched into a roaring furnace, no questions asked. Who is the God who can rescue you from my power? Shadrach, Meshach, and Nebuchadnezzar asked King Nebuchadnezzar, answered King Nebuchadnezzar, your threat means nothing to us. If you throw us in the fire, the God we serve can rescue us from your roaring furnace and anything else you might cook up, O king. But even if he doesn't, it wouldn't make a bit of difference, O king. We still wouldn't serve your gods or worship the gold statue you set up. Just leave it up there for a second. Think about those words, even if he doesn't. That is massive. These boys needed a certain outcome. They did not want to be roasted alive. That isn't fun. That isn't something that you think. But the fact that they had somehow believed in this God so incredibly that under the threat of their life and in a situation where they could have just got out of it because they could have said to God, God, we, you know we still believe in you, but it's not really what you want for us to die. So we'll just say that we worship the king. We'll go through the motions. But really, you can see our heart and you know we still belong to you. They just wouldn't go there. They said, you know what? I can believe God for a certain outcome. And I know God can get me out of this. But even if he doesn't, he is still my choice. <laughs> I just think that's amazing. And we have a choice. When it seems like something is missing... 
and that somehow or other you're not getting an outcome that you so desperately want or desperately feel you need, we have a choice to bow to the authority that seems to hold the most potential for you getting that and somehow get you out of it, or to bow to the king saying, I know he is able, but whether I see the outcome I desire right now or not, he is my choice. <gasps> Don't you think that's just, oh, oh, I think it's amazing. Now, we read this with hindsight and think, well, yeah, you know, God rescued them. That fire was hot and that was scary. And when they were going in, they didn't know if they were going to come out. And yet that was their choice. Now, I wanted to show you something else. If you've been around church a long time, even if you hadn't, you might have heard of Paul's thorn in the flesh. Who's ever heard of Paul's thorn in the flesh, right? Let me just read you this passage from 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7 to 10. Okay. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassing great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, we could talk about that for about three hours, couldn't we? It raises so many uh, questions and makes so many good points. Now, if you type into Google, Paul's thorn in the flesh, you get so many different interpretations of what that could mean. And every single one you read is absolutely convinced that they've got the one that is the answer. And when I was thinking about it, I was thinking, yeah, there was some I read that I thought, that's the one I think is most likely. That's the one. I always think, which one would I imagine Ant saying? And I think, yeah, he'd probably say that. Um, And I'm sure he could do a great job of dissecting it. But the point about this thorn tonight is that it is ambiguous. We don't know exactly what it is. But the point I want to make from this is the conclusion that Paul comes to. And he says, my grace is sufficient. Well, that's what he hears. He said to me, he hears Jesus say, my grace is sufficient for you. So whatever the thorn is, be that a thorn from God, from life, from people, from the devil, whatever that thorn is and whatever the thorn is in your life, all I want you to get from that passage tonight is the conclusion that Paul comes to. He says God's grace is sufficient. And sometimes we get so obsessed with the thorns that we miss the point that grace is sufficient to handle any and all of the outcomes going on in our life. And if we would focus more on the sufficiency of his grace than getting rid of the thorns, we would find the power to walk with the thorn until the thorn goes or to find a way for the thorn to be removed. But the first thing is the sufficiency of his grace. Yes, that's our focus. Okay. Isaiah 6, verse 9, verse 6. Don't worry about putting this one up. I kept thinking about this this week, is the bit where um, Jesus is being prophesied that he's going to come to earth. It says, for for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And and it says, we'll know no end to to his increase and power in life. All I kept thinking this week was, he shall be called Wonderful. And I just thought, he shall be called wonderful. And when I looked what wonderful meant, it meant a miracle, a marvelous thing, a wonder. And I just thought that's, that's absolutely gorgeous. And when these people were looking forward to this Messiah and God was speaking through his prophets to what he was going to be like, they came to the conclusion that he shall be called wonderful. And I thought, who's going to be calling him wonderful? And I thought, Wouldn't it be amazing tonight if we all came to the conclusion that he is, he is wonderful, that he is a miracle, a marvelous thing, a wonder. And the father was foreseeing that some would grasp the wonder of the son and would grasp that he is sufficient 
and that he would be our choice and that at his name, we were going to bow when he does and even if he doesn't in our way and our time. And that because of his obedience to a process, that he had to throw all of his eggs in one basket. He had to trust the father to lay down his life and take it up again. And because of that, we stand forgiven and acquitted as we'd already heard tonight. Now, does God get all the outcomes he wants? <gasps> Good question. I don't think I can look at things I see in the world and think God's got everything he wants. I, I think we'd struggle, wouldn't we, to think God has everything that he want, wanted when he made the world. But I thought, well, no, but does it make him less than he is and less wonderful? And does it diminish his worthiness? And when you or I have lives, like Beth was saying, that don't look perhaps how we think they should look, does it diminish, make us less than we are, less than enough, or diminish our worthiness in some way? Now, there's a book that you, people have been reading, you know, Richard Raw Falling Upwards. If you've not read it, it is an amazing book. And because people kept saying they're rereading it, I was thinking, I'm going to reread it as well. And it is an amazing book. And, you, um, and he talks about, a few things that I really felt were relevant tonight. He talks about an inner unfolding of things and how when things are sort of working out, it creates a lot of doubt and anxiety for many of us who believe God because we seem to prefer a touch, uh, um, sorry, a touch a magic wand kind of God. We want God to come with his magic wand and go, dun, 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 there, fix it. Oh, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> wouldn't that be nice? Um, we prefer this to a God who works secretly, so we sometimes don't know what he's doing or where he's coming from, and humbly, and who in includes us in on the process and the conclusion. The only price we pay for living in the big picture of everything God is, of his wonder, is to hold a bit of doubt and anxiety about the exact how, who, when, where, and who of it all but never the that. So what he was saying was that actually when we really come to this Christ, there will be some doubt and anxiety and uncertainty about the mystery of it all. But somehow or other, if we can grasp the big picture, that he is a miracle, a wonder, that he, he does see it all, that somehow we can live like that. Now it goes on to say this, unfortunately most Christians are not well trained in holding opposites for very long of living with what could be very creative tension of the terrible and the wonderful. And I thought, isn't that sometimes what life is like? That somehow you've got the tension between the terrible and the wonderful in your life. That you know it all and see it all and have had a revelation of this great Christ, but there's also things in your life that you think, what? That bit fills me with terror and that bit feels terrible. But there's an experience where you can somehow live in the tension between the two. Now, what can we believe that will help with that? That God is absolutely inclusive, which means he has room to include all of my life and all of yours. He can include all of it. And our outcome obsession can be driven what we want to see included and excluded. So we can think, I must gain this job, this relationship, this confidence I need, this X, yeah? And I must lose this conflict, this sickness, and this worry. And we spend our life thinking I must gain certain stuff and lose certain stuff. And God doesn't see it like that. God just says, do you know what? Bring the lot. Bring the stuff. You won't bring the stuff you love to get rid of. Just bring the lot and stop trying to work out your outcomes and just come to me and let me deal with what's incoming. Because if my spirit is incoming in your life, I can sort all the outcomings but start there. Now, there may be very worthy, legitimate dreams and prayers that we have for our life. But I can't say today whether you'll see a result Tonight, this week, this year, this decade, it, it remains a mystery. And if we cannot hold fully within that tension of longing for stuff, but still being whole, life becomes pretty unbearable and pretty impossible. Now, did those boys need rescuing from the fire? Yes. 
And did they want rescuing? Yes. And did they get rescued? Yes, because actually there was a fourth man in their fire. It says when they, you know, when they went down, they saw four men. And, you know, that could be an angel. It could be the Christ himself. Now, do you need rescuing from the stuff in your life that might be heating up? Yes. Do you want rescuing? Yes. Will you get rescued? Do you know what? The man is there for you too. And I believe yes, but I don't know how that will look. Eek. And I don't know when it will be. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I wish I did. Now, last week, Anth was talking about how... Um, the wonder of what happened in Christ was that we now live horizontally with God. It's not God there, me here. It's God with us in me. I mean, that's huge, huge that we get to have this horizontal relationship with God and that he's in us. We get to share in the divine nature. And do you get that? Steve just made the point. It's never too late to be born again. Do you realize you get to share a divine nature? Woo, that's that's fairly cool. That's massive. Um, I've lost my place. No one's bothered, are they? <laughs> but the question is, why can't I just... Right, the, but this is the question we come to. Why cannot I just see... Why can't I just see what I want to see now? Do you know why? Because actually, us sharing in the di- divine nature goes beyond the outcomes. It, it really does. It's huge. Now, like I said, my, my son the other day, I was preparing this, and it's been a bit of a busy week, um, and he's so good for me. So I thought, I'm going to find out what Daniel thinks. And after the first two questions, I started writing it down because I thought, you might as well just get up and preach this. So this is word for word what my nine-year-old said. And, um, you know, all credit to the team here because they get a lot of good stuff from the platform, goes filtered through in a way that the kids can hear. It's amazing, right? This, mine were the questions, his were the answers. I promise you, I've not, the only bit I cut out is he started going on about zoo. zoo. I'll put the Zeus and Hercules bit in as well, because that was quite cool. Here we go. I asked him, (laughs) he's looking like, oh, this bit's mine. He's going, yay, me. Um, Why don't we get everything we want? His answer was this, we're not God. We're not magicians. And most of all, we're just not perfect. Why doesn't God just fix it and do what we want? Because he believes we can handle it. Why does he think we can handle it? Well, because he's inside us. We don't need a magic wand. He's with us. What, what shall I do then if I've got a tricky ha- situation and I need God to help me? Just keep on going. What should you believe? Oh, that we can accomplish anything in him. Accomplish. Nine. Nine. Come on, English teacher. Nine. <laughs> that, we, <laughs> that we can accomplish anything with him. What if it takes a long time? Just trust in God. How will that help? Because God's God. He said it like that. He is king of all the gods. He is king of Zeus and Hercules. And that's why he possesses all the forgiveness, grace, and love that goes round. That's it, isn't it? (laughs) You know, when you just think, if he's nine and he gets it, out of the mouth, what's the thing, out of the mouth of, yeah, that thing, yeah. I just thought it was amazing because they see it as simple, don't they? And our heads just get complicated because we think of that, 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 and our history. Even if he doesn't, my resolution is that I'm not going to bow to anything other than his wonder. Um, He's able to include, accommodate, and redeem all parts of mine and your story and make everything beautiful in its time. Remember what we said last week, don't judge anything before its time. He's able to make everything beautiful in its time. He's able to do that. His grace is sufficient. And you know what? We have to learn to live in the tension be Christ-focused, income, what's incoming, not outcome-focused. Because outcome-focused means you have to avoid the fire at all costs. You'll be God, you'll take over, you'll distance and enslave yourself. Christ-focused means you can walk into it if you must. How? Because you believe that Sarah is still able to birth the promise. So you don't need another alternative. Believe he is able with all your heart. And you know, I'm not diminishing, praying, believing, because I know there's some very specific outcomes in here that people need to see. But we cannot live our life on hold waiting for outcomes. We, We can't. Final point from this book I read from Richard Raw. Your concern is not so much to have what you love anymore, but to love what you have right now. 
He talks as well in this book about dualistic thinking, and we've, we've heard a bit about this before, about knowing by comparison, that we look at our life and we, we compare and work out what's the rights, what's the wrongs, what's the good, what's the bad. And he talks about how it is insufficient. Remember, we've talked about the sufficiency of grace. It is insufficient for the big issues. And this is what he says happen, happened. I love this, partly because it's a rule of three and it uses alliteration, but I also like it, okay? It says, <laughs> I can't help it, I just see it. It's like I get excited about semicolons. It's ridiculous, right? This is what he said. We've talked about the sufficiency of grace, okay? He says it's insufficiency. Knowing by comparison is insufficient for the big issues. It says this. It mangles, manipula- manipulates, and minimizes the brilliance of Jesus. So if you look at your life and start measuring the goods, the bads, what I'm getting, what I'm not getting, what, is it working out? It should be working. We mangle, manipulate, and minimize the brilliance of Jesus. We miss the point says this. I'm nearly there, I promise. I've got five more lines. Let truth teach you on its own terms. Not on your terms, on its own terms. Work with your imperfections. Hold people, see and create wholeness wherever they go. Split people, see and create splits in everything and everybody. So wholeness comes when we learn to live in the tension between yes, there's terrible things, but there's also the wonder of the sun and both are all right because both are part of my story. So I'm still whole. He shall be called wonderful. Can you call him wonderful tonight? Make him your choice because we've not got to let his brilliance get lost in our stuff. We get our stuff lost in his brilliance. Yes. If you want to make God your choice tonight, stand with me. Let's pray. Okay. Right. Tonight, God, we've got a lot of people in here, myself included, and we'd love to see some certain outcomes in our life. Things we might have been waiting for, believing for, wondering when it will happen, why it hasn't happened, and all the questions that that brings. But tonight, we hear the voice of heaven from Father God pointing to the Son, saying, He shall be called Wonderful. And we look at you tonight and say, we see that you are wonderful. Not because you give us every single thing we want and just click yes to everything we ask for, but because you are able to include every single thing in our life as part of your story. And that there's nothing we need to get rid of and nothing we need to somehow pursue to be whole tonight. Because tonight we can live with the tensions that might be in our life of the things that we'd love to be different, but we can also see that you're able to handle it all. And tonight we choose to bow. We choose to bow whatever the outcomes are this week, this month, this year, because we bow to the wonder of the sun. And we know that if we focus on everything that you pour into our life, we can handle whatever it brings, and we know that your grace is sufficient. So I ask God today that you will give everyone in this place tonight a a view of your wonder and help us to just embrace our stories and help us not to live life on hold, but to actually find a way to be whole tonight, not because of everything we've got, but because of who you are and the fact that you live and reside within us. Just keep us strong, Lord. Help everyone in here. And where there are specific outcomes that you are working, then God, I just pray that there'll be a free flow from heaven to get everything that everybody needs into this place. And in the meantime, we'll just keep looking to you and at your mystery and wonder, believing that your grace is sufficient. Thank you, Jesus. Yay. Okay, I'll just quickly finish off. That was totally awesome, Jenny. Wasn't it awesome, eh? Yeah, delivery and everything, just totally exceptional. Um, The one thing that sprung out to me when you were speaking, um, I was looking at a Twitter uh, the other day that said said this. It said, I believe that God can do miracles, but I never want to be in the place where I need need a miracle. And I'm thinking, that's a really weird thing to say. Because I'm thinking, like, what is your definition of miracles then? Because to me, like every single second I breathe, I feel like I'm living in the reality of a miracle. And I thought, you know, how much, and this was, this was written by someone, I think, over in the States, um, you know, clearly a Christian. 
I'm thinking that we, we've boxed up what a miracle means because of like what Jenny said about you've heard things through your life and then you now process it through a filter, believing that everything has to look a certain way. And yet, did Jesus dying on the cross look right? You know, we get all mad at you know, the Pharisees and the people who killed him. But yet, if you'd have been there, Jesus was the manifestation of God in the earth and he was there bleeding to death on a cross. Thinking back now, I don't know if I would have been too happy with that. So it didn't look quite how God, you know, the Father should have looked, you know, there bleeding and basically not being able to help himself. So for me, the reality I wanna live in after what's been spoken tonight is totally embracing the tension. What is good, what is bad, it doesn't matter. It is what it is. To me, it's all about living within the life and the knowledge that Christ is brilliant, I love that. The brilliance of Christ, the brilliance of Christ. And that to some degree, you have to ask yourself the question, in your day-to-day -day life, do you live in terror all the time with moments of hope? Or do you live in hope with every so often just a little bit of a niggle? Asking yourself that question will really find out where you are in here. Because if you live your life believing that you live in a world of grace, there's going to be very little that will ruffle your feathers. Even the things that go wrong, you won't believe it's wrong. You'll just believe like what I thought what Daniel said was awesome. It just is what it is. God is still God. You walk life, you live life. And I think take that away tonight and believe that his grace is sufficient for you. The only thing you should be focusing on is that his grace is sufficient. To some degree, we should be rejoicing when things aren't working because like it said, that's when Christ kicks into action. And yet for some reason, we want to take over and make everything just look okay. Doesn't matter. Relax, like Jenny said. Just surrender it all and allow him to be God, whatever that looks like. All right? You're amazing. Love you all. Jenny, fantastic again. Absolutely awesome. You were great. Um, don't forget, we've got the Pillars special tonight. If you're new to us, we have like a restaurant service in the back. Um, you'll be able to meet a few of the guys. If you're new, please don't go. Stay with us. It'll be great to meet you and um, have a chat to you. And we'll see the rest of you on Wednesday. All right, take care, guys.